one of the most common situations I hear about is, well, after the breakup, I already like pleaded, I already pursued, or I tried to persuade, I tried to talk them out of it. And I didn't find your videos until after I'd done that, and I feel like I sabotaged it. If you did that, there are different levels to it. But if you've done that, it's a really common thing. So most people don't know about no contact. They don't know how to respond, especially if you didn't see the breakup coming. So don't beat yourself up. And don't think, well, because I've already chased, now I'm, now I'm pot invested. It's already too late for me. And, you know, pot has different meanings, but you get the idea. I'm talking about the card game. Anyway, now, now I'm invested in this pursuit. It's too late for me to project strength. It's too late for me to do no contact. And you might even get this reaction from them. Maybe they're not sure. Or maybe when you initially chased, you talked them out of it for the moment. But it didn't talk them out of it long term. And maybe they broke up with you the next day. A lot of times if somebody says, I'm thinking about it. And you say, well, let's just give it a week. Usually just give it a week is going to end up being, we're going to break up in a week. Because even in that week, what you're doing is saying, can I have a week to audition? Like, it's almost like somebody telling you you're going to get fired. And you said, well, can, can I have a week to prove to you why I'm going to be here? You're already not in a powerful position. You're already in a situation, just by agreeing to that, that doesn't project strength. You're trying harder, which it seems illogical. But in relationships, sometimes the harder you try, the more you pursue, the more that you push, that doesn't actually project strength. You're telling yourself, what you're doing is actually displaying loyalty and love and determination and patience and even humility because you're willing to give them what they need. You just need a week to show it to them. But it ends up projecting dependence, desperation, neediness, and all the things that aren't associated with strength. So if you're in the middle of a tryout stage right now, I would recommend you give them the breakup. If somebody says, I want to break up, but I'm not sure. Don't try to plead or pursue at all. Just let them have the breakup. But now going quickly back to the common situation of they broke up with you, you chased and you pleaded. Well, there are different levels to it. So let's go by the first and more common one. Somebody breaks up with you and that night or whenever they do it, you're trying to text back and forth. You're trying to keep them in the conversation. You're trying to explain to them that you believe the two of you belong together. You're trying to explain to them all the advantages, all the reasons. And all the things that they're giving you for breaking up with you, all the reasons and motivations they're giving you, and chances are they're not telling you everything. There might be some real truth in what they're telling you, but there's some other things that they're probably leaving out. Like when you've broken up with somebody, did you really tell them the full truth? Did you tell them something like, and, and even though I'm attracted to you, I'm not as attracted to you as I want to be long term to be with somebody exclusively forever. I mean, the last couple of years have been great, but, but deep down, I've always kind of thought I could do better. You're not going to say that. They're not going to say that to you, but it's still normal for you to ask why they're breaking up with you and maybe you did that and maybe that conversation led to you trying to talk them out of it that's the most common situation that's the most average situation if you did that don't panic take a deep breath keep this in mind the principle of no contact doesn't have to be and is very rarely implemented perfectly right it's not going to be implemented immediately it's not instinctive it's not natural it's natural to fight for the thing that you love. It's natural to fight for the person you love. It's very natural to engage in debate when somebody strongly disagrees with you about something that means a lot and your relationship probably meant a lot or you wouldn't be watching this video. So if you chase them, take it off the checklist mentally. Stop carrying around that burden thinking if I'd found these videos or if I'd, found, if I'd learned about no contact in advance, I wouldn't have already messed it up. A lot of times that calculator, what we call the orchestrator mentality, the one that's good with planning, the one that's good with precision, the one that's just kind of good with laying out all the facts and details and coming up with a master strategy or plan because they're gifted problem solvers, they're usually the ones that will beat themselves up the most after a breakup because of course they didn't get it exactly right. But now they're walking around thinking, oh, if I had just had that breakup conversation now, I'd know exactly what I'd say. If I could just have a chance to redo that beginning, then I wouldn't have ruined it. But I think I already ruined it. They look at no contact like an engine and they accidentally left out a, a key part and now it's never going to run right. That's not how no contact works. So take a deep breath. Give yourself the benefit of the doubt. R trust me when I tell you the vast majority, 99% of people after a breakup, try to talk the other person out of it. If the relationship means anything to them, it doesn't mean no contact doesn't work. It doesn't mean it hasn't already started working. But at the initial stage of no contact, it's going to feel like it doesn't work. And when it feels like it doesn't work, when you're in that stage where it feels like you're staring at rocks and nothing's happening, and then you like check back and find out, well, it says 30 days or 45 or 60 days and I don't see anything happening. I'm, what I'm doing is a waste of time. I'm not fighting for my relationship. Don't trust that feeling. It might feel like you're staring at rocks, but there could be a volcano forming. You won't know it until it breaks the surface. You won't know it's working until it works. So stop believing that you sabotaged it and ruined it early because you didn't implement no contact immediately. Very few people implement no contact immediately. And if they do, 
it might it might hint at some kind of narcissism. Most people don't do it instinctively if they're losing a relationship that they really value. It's just human instinct to fight to hold on to what you love. Okay, the next stage is maybe you didn't just fight that night for the relationship. Maybe you tried to argue, maybe you tried to plead, maybe you agreed to the audition stage, never agreed to the audition stage, but maybe you've already done it. Maybe you feel like you're, you're coming up on that stage now and you're coming up on that day, that deadline. Maybe they give you a week, maybe they gave you a month. Whatever it is, if you're in the middle of that, if you've chased more than that night, stop. Stop now. Again, it doesn't mean you ruined it. Take a deep breath. I promise you, I promise you, you didn't ruin something long term. What you did is kind of like you hit the pause button. If they kind of saw themselves in the relationship and they're breaking up with you and they see you liking them this much and you, they only like you this much, the more you chase, the more you're doing this. Because again, what we think of as projecting love, determination, and loyalty is accidentally projecting dependence, desperation, and neediness. I'm not saying you're needy because you love the person that you want to get back with. I'm saying if they tell you they don't want to be with you and you're trying to talk them out of it, it's more likely projecting neediness than it is that rare love and strength that you think is going to draw them back. So take a deep breath. If you've just kind of pushed it and made it worse, maybe more than just that night of the breakup, like I said, maybe you've been doing it for weeks. Maybe you've been doing it longer. Or maybe it's not an everyday thing where you're reaching out to them every day for weeks, but maybe you go a week and then reach out. Maybe two weeks. Maybe you give it the 30-day try, but then you keep giving them that reassurance. What's happening is you're convincing yourself because you already chased, maybe it's too late to do no contact the right way. So you're trying to do this subtle kind of muddled version of it by reaching out consistently because every so often, every week or two, you're afraid it's not working. Again, it's like you're staring at rocks. Well, if I'm staring at rocks, I'm not going to just let the person that I love most, the person I believe I belong with, just fade away. Every day they're getting further away. Every day they're looking back at me less. They're getting stronger without me. And every day I'm getting more panicked. Take a deep breath and stop and realize that's not true. We don't work like we think we work. We're not as logical as we think we are. So just because you've gone a month and you haven't heard from them, that doesn't mean that they're not thinking about you. If you chase them, then you gave them the mental reassurance, the emotional reassurance that they haven't lost you. Maybe the reason you haven't heard from them, maybe the reason they don't regret the decision of losing you, it's because they still haven't felt like they've lost you. I mean, put yourself in their spot. If you broke up with somebody and they tried to talk you out of it, they tried to plead with you and chase you, and then they reached out to you a week later or two weeks later, 30 days later, and said, are you still thinking about me? And they said, are you still sure? Do you want to talk? If someone did that to you, you would feel more confident that even though time has passed, they're still there. So stop giving them sporadic confidence that you haven't really gone anywhere. What you're slowly accidentally doing is teaching them to think, hey, even if you haven't heard from me in a while, just know that I'm thinking about you. Even if I don't reach out to you for a week or two, trust me, I'm still thinking, I'm still walking around with you in my mind. If you ever change your mind, I'm right here. And that's one of the terms you don't want to say. If you said it, don't let it panic you. But if you said something like, hey, if you ever change your mind, I'm right here. I'm always going to love you. I respectfully disagree with your decision. So if you ever change your mind, just know I'm always going to love you. Don't say anything like that. If you have said something like that, it's still not over. That's what I'm talking about with chasing and pleading. That's a definite plead. And if you did that, then yeah, it's like, it's like the metaphor that I, I use a lot of times. Your relationship is like a house. When they break up with you, it's like you went out the front door of the house. But if you plead, pursue, or try to persuade them to take you back, it's like you told them, hey, I'm going to be right here on the porch because I don't think I should move out. I'm giving you your space. I agree with your decision. I can't force my way to stay in your house, but I'm going to be right here. And then it's like every week or two, you're ringing the doorbell. Hey, just to let you know, I know we haven't talked in a while, but if you just started to wonder if maybe you've lost me, if you're just starting to wonder if maybe you made a mistake letting go of me, I just want to let you know, you still haven't lost me. I'm right here. So if you're in that middle ground, you didn't just try to talk them out of it at the beginning and you're not like reaching out to them every day. You're not pleading. You're not on the verge of getting a, a restraining order issued against you, but you are consistently just kind of going, Hey, I'm right here. They have to have a sense that possibly you're gone. What you really want to get to is this idea that you're definitely strong enough to live without them. And if you can do that, if you chase and plead at the beginning, but then you actually move forward and project, even if you don't feel it, but project resilience, project strength, project confidence in yourself that with them or without them, you're going to live a good life because you're an exceptional person, because there are things about you that are more central and more foundational to who you are, to the purpose that you have in life is greater than their feelings about you. Now, you might not feel that way, but the more you can project it, what it tends to do is retroactively frame you chasing them. So let me explain what I mean by that. 
let's say, uh, God forbid, my wife breaks up with me. And I try to talk her out of it because I'm, I'm human and I don't want to lose her. So I'm telling her all the reasons we belong together and how much I love her and the things that I can change and the things that I understand that she needs now. Whatever I'm trying to tell her. But then I stop because I can't talk her out of it. And she's, she's like determined in her decision. So she walks away. Now, even though I pled and even though I pursued and tried to get her to come back, sometimes even desperately, if I stop that, then it retroactively reframes my pursuit as coming from legitimate strength. If I try to talk her out of it, and then the next week I try to talk her out of it again, and then two weeks later or a month later, I'm still trying to talk her out of it. What I think is loyalty and what I think, what I think is me fighting for the love of my life is actually very much coming across like desperation, need. Like, I don't have a purpose without you. I don't, I don't have excitement about my own life. I don't think of my life as an adventure that I'm lucky to be living. I think of myself as empty without you. Your life is the purpose of my life. That's not attractive. But now if I can project strength, resilience, refocus on myself, refocus on my purpose, my identity without them, and show that I believe in the life that I'm going to live, I know that you were lucky to have me. Then it reframes that pursuit as coming from a place of sincerity, of coming from a place of strength. So kind of going by that example again, let's say that you broke up with somebody, put yourself in that situation, and they try to talk you out of it. That's actually going to even more separate that emotional connection. Because you know you just told them you don't want to be with them, and they're trying to talk you out of it? That emotional sense of balance is now really out of whack. But let's say after they tried to talk you out of it for the first night or even that first week, but then they go quiet for a couple of months. When you think about them and you remember that they tried to talk you out of it, you're going to think, well, of course, it, it kind of caught them off guard. They really cared about me. They really loved me. They valued me enough that they wanted to hold on to the relationship. But once they understood that I really wanted to break up, they've moved on. And you actually assigned them a level of strength. It kind of recorrects this. It kind of goes back and reframes it as, okay, they were trying to talk me out of it because they really love me. They really believe we belong together. It wasn't desperation. If it was desperation, they would have kept chasing. They stopped chasing, which means that they did it because they really wanted to hold on to me, not because they needed to hold on to me. Maybe I did lose something. Maybe I should second guess this. Now, keep in mind, there's something primal in the way we're wired. If somebody has consistently given you a sense of value, a sense of worth, and then they withdraw it, it triggers something primal in us. Unless you're a psychopath or a sociopath, it triggers a sense of loss. That sense of loss is closely assigned and attached to our ego. In other words, even if you're confident you want to break up with somebody, if they take it well and stop pursuing you and project strength, it instinctively kind of makes you question yourself. Well, I know why I didn't want to be with them, but I kind of thought they were going to chase me harder. I mean, especially when I broke up with them and they tried to talk me out of it that night. They even tried to talk me out of it the next day. But after that, I haven't really heard from them. I mean, I'm, I'm glad because we always want to, you know, have this image of ourselves that we're very thoughtful and empathetic and we care that we hurt about hurt that other person, and we do. But even the most humble and sincere of us has a healthy functioning ego. Again, unless you're a psychopath or a sociopath, it's going to trigger this self-doubt. So there have probably been people in your past that you broke up with. And when they took it well, it actually kind of made you reframe them as stronger, maybe even a little bit more valuable than you thought they were before they broke up with you. And even more, it triggers a self-analysis. Well, I know why I don't want to be with them, but why didn't they want to be with me? I thought after they chased me, I thought they were going to chase me for a while. Did they find somebody else already? Did they realize maybe I'm not as great as they thought I was? Am I not as great as I thought I was? It's human instinct. Ego drives us. It compels us to self-analyze. And that a lot of times is, is connected to re-triggering re-attraction. It's more likely to be the case if they haven't found somebody else. If they found somebody else, it'll still reframe you as strength if you stop chasing. It might not be enough to draw them back because maybe they're in limerence with somebody else and it's going to take a little bit of time for them to find out the flaws and realize the, the reality of being with that other person doesn't match up with the fantasy that they imagine when they broke up with you. Sometimes it can take longer. But the point is, whatever the situation is, if you started chasing but then stop, it can actually really work for you. There's also an aspect of pattern interruption. So if they're used to you reaching out, if they've come up, become accustomed to the idea that even when they're trying to break up with you, you're still kind of tailing along, you're still, you're still right there on the porch, then looking out, imagine that they look out on the porch and one day you're gone. And now it's been, now it's been a month, maybe it's been two months, 
Now you're not only not on the porch, you're not in the yard. They can't see you on the street. That starts to make them wonder what you're doing. That's when they'll tend to look at you online, try to find out through friends, and they'll do it from a position of strength. Like, I'm, I'm glad he's doing better. I'm glad she's doing better. She, she doing better? Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad they got over me that quickly. They really got over me that quickly, huh? So trust me, if you chase them even more than the more average situation where you try to talk them out of it just that night or the next morning, maybe you've been reaching out to them sporadically for a while. It's okay. Don't feel like you sabotaged it long term. Don't feel like you sabotaged it forever. But take a deep breath. Take a deep breath and realize if you have chased them, there's a big advantage there. There's a part of your mind that, that instinctively, let's say you did no contact at the beginning. There's going to be a time when you're doing no contact that you wonder if it's the right decision. One advantage you have if you overly chase them in the beginning of the breakup is that you've probably learned that doesn't work. So now going into no contact, you have a bit of an advantage over people that went into no contact quickly. You know that chasing doesn't work. And even if no contact is painful, you've kind of proven to yourself that it's your best shot because you've already gone the other route of trying to plead them to come back. So in a way, you have a bit of an advantage, but don't waste it. Remember that you tried. That way when that voice whispers in your ear that, hey, you're not fighting for the relationship, I bet they're just embarrassed. I bet they just think if they came back to you, you wouldn't want them. You're going to have that little voice whisper in your ear and try to knock you out of no contact. Well, if you chase them more than the average person, you're less likely to believe that voice. The last version I want to get into is when you've chased them to an extreme level. Like there's the more average, like, hey, I didn't know about no contact until it happened. There's the one that not only, the second one is when I not only tried to talk them out of it that night, but the next day or the next week. And then there's the extreme version of chasing. You pled, you begged, you cried during the breakup, the next day, the next day, and you get the idea. And maybe the most you've been able to string together is two or three days, but you're still pleading. You're not just chasing, you're in desperate pursuit mode. If that's you, take a deep breath. Normally the, the people that deal with this level of chasing, it's really easy to make fun of. Like the world might go, oh, what a simp. Oh, what a weakling. Oh, that's pathetic. He or she would never want to be with somebody as weak as you. And maybe you're the voice telling you that. Your friends and family are probably trying to be understanding. They might say something like, I don't know why you'd even want them. You need to get over them. He's a narcissist or she's a manipulator, whatever it is. But if you're in this situation, don't beat yourself up so much. Truthfully, the people that I talk to that are this level of desperate pursuit are some of the most impressive people that I talk to. Now, they can give me flashbacks because I've, I've been through the situations that we're talking about. And sometimes when I'm talking to them, I can, I can feel it in my chest. I get angry on their behalf. I'll be hurt on their behalf. It's like there's a, there's a very strong sense. If you've lived through anything like this, it kind of gives you a, a deep empathy for people going through it. So sometimes when I'm talking to those people, I might even get angry, which sounds like a really bad code, so forgive me for that. But I'll get angry on their behalf because I know that pain that is driving you to do it. One of the first things you need to do is stop. Take a deep breath. Stop framing yourself as weak, as pathetic, as something that's kind of beneath them now because you couldn't let the relationship go. Understand that that level of depth a lot of times comes from an exceptional heart. It comes from somebody that's unusually gifted. The people that chase the most, believe it or not, are not the most pathetic people that you know. They're some of the most impressive, talented, gifted, artistic, creative. So it's, it's not a matter of being weak. Like look at pain and the depth of your pain as a nice indicator of what your potential is. If you can feel pain on a scale of 1 to 10, if, if, sometimes I'll talk to somebody and I'll say, okay, so on a scale of 1 to 10, what's your pain level? 137. Okay, painful. I understand. I've been there. But if your pain is so overwhelming to the point that most of the people around you can't understand it, then chances are there are other things about you that are outside the norm as well. You might have a gifted intellect. You might have a gifted ability. You might have an artistic or creative side to you. You might have the ability to inspire. You might have the ability to innovate. If you feel pain to that level, then you can feel other things to that level. Things like love, things like excitement, things like inspiration, motivation. If you feel things to that level, you can probably connect and make people feel understood. You're probably the kind of person people lean on or turn to. You might be the kind of person that can create art in a way that moves people. Well, why could you do that? Because if you feel things that deeply, you tend to be more naturally gifted at expressing things more brilliantly. So take a deep breath. Stop taking your pain as evidence that you're pathetic. And why would somebody want to be with you? Take a deep breath and realize maybe it's an indicator of what you're capable of in other areas as well. It's really important to reframe your pain as evidence of strength not undeniable proof that you're weak. It's really hard for you to project strength enough to reattract somebody if you don't even like or admire yourself. Second thing to do is don't trust that feeling. 
don't trust the feeling that, hey, if I've chased them this much and I'm this pathetic, I'm already committed to the idea of ultimate opposite no contact. I'm already committed to the idea of chasing. It's too late for me. I've been begging and pleading for the last week or month. Maybe it's even been longer. Maybe you've been chasing for two or three months. Maybe, like I said, you're right on the verge of a restraining order. Well, take a deep breath and stop. You've kind of set yourself up in a lot of ways. You have a couple of big advantages. One is you have absolutely proven the pursuit doesn't work. So stop thinking that you're, you know, committed to this route. You're not committed to that route. And you know now it doesn't work. Take a deep breath and realize, okay, now you have the perfect opportunity to really get their attention. Because number one, if they've let you chase them that long and they haven't blocked you or you don't have a restraining order, there's probably some part of them that isn't 100% sure they don't want to be with you. So don't kid yourself. People aren't nearly as logical or as certain in their beliefs as they want to project. We're made up of emotion. We're made up of ego, fear of loss, regretting a decision, analysis of the person that we let go of because we're trying to make sure that they're not quite as good after us. Nobody wants to break up with somebody and really see them succeed and thrive and live this incredible life. The truth is we want to know that we made the right decision. We want to know that when we let that person go, okay, we're not going to regret it. We found somebody else that we fit with better and we're going to have a better, more exceptional life with this new person. We don't want to see the other person explode and thrive without us. It's going to make us feel like, ugh, maybe I got that call wrong. So if you have pled, chased, and just kind of, in your mind, embarrassed yourself, and to be honest, maybe you have, but that doesn't mean that you have to keep embarrassing yourself. And if you've chased them to that degree and then you stop, you're even more so going to get their attention. Like, let's say I have somebody going back to that house and porch metaphor. Well, in this version, they're not only camped out on the porch. Every five minutes, they're banging on the window. Every 10 minutes, they're sliding a note under the door. Every 30 seconds, they're ringing the doorbell. I'm still out here. Ding, dong, ding. I am right here. Are you, just in case you, okay. Well, now imagine that that stops. There's no doorbell. There's no message under the door. There's no banging on the window. As a, as a matter of fact, you're actually going to be a little curious. Now, maybe initially it's going to be like, oh, good. They finally went away. But just give it a beat. Give it a couple of days, give it a couple of weeks. And then human instinct again, it's like, well, as much as it was annoying, it is kind of nice knowing that somebody can want me so much that after I broke up with them, they're desperate to get me back. I mean, it was, it was annoying and I told them to go away and I told them that we're never getting back together. That's another thing that will happen if you chase or plead or pursue for too long. You're accidentally putting them in a position where they have to defend the breakup. So if you say, hey, do you want to break up? Well, I, I think so. Are you sure? Well, I mean, yeah, I guess I do. Are you sure? Yeah, I do. Are you positive? Yes, I'm positive. Are you absolutely certain? Yes, I'm absolutely. You see, the more you're asking, the more you're chasing, the more you're putting them in a position where they're instinctively reinforcing their position. But then when you stop, imagine that all of a sudden it's quiet. Well, I wonder what happened to that person that was banging on the window. Give it enough time and emotionally it's like they're going to the window to check. You still out there? Uh, I mean, I'm not second guessing my decision, but let me let me check them on social media. Did they start dating somebody? Did they get another job? Oh my word, have they been working out? Do they look better? They do, they look better. All of a sudden it's like, well, maybe that person that was banging on the window, I underestimated. Maybe I took them for granted. And maybe if you give them a little bit of time, even if they broke up with you for somebody else, you give them enough time, they're gonna find out that that other person isn't as perfect as they imagined them to be. Because the reality, even true love, the reality of true love never matches up to the fantasy. And that's okay. But you're giving them the chance to find out the flaws in that other person without you constantly being there to reinforce that, hey, if that doesn't work out with them, I'm right here. Also, if you're chasing and they're with somebody else, which is a lot of times the situation with somebody who's very much in pursuit or desperately chasing, a lot of times they're desperately chasing because their ex is with somebody else, which gives you this, this sense of panic. The sense of I need to act now. I got to do something proactive. I got to stop that new relationship before they ride off in the sunset happily ever after. Well, if you're chasing them because of that, you're reinforcing that relationship. One of the key aspects of limerence is a sense of forbiddenness. When it's new, it's exciting. They're, they're kind of flawless because you don't know the drawbacks to being with them. But when something's forbidden, it magnifies the attraction. So when you're chasing after them, after they break up with you and they're in that new relationship, which scares you so much that that's part of what's causing you to chase them, whether you know it or not, you're accidentally reinforcing that bond. You're magnifying the attraction to each other that they have. You're becoming a topic of conversation. Did he still reach out to you today? Is she still trying to talk you into going back to her? Yeah, they reached out to me, but I told them that it's not going to happen. You did? Yeah, I told them. Here, I'll show you the message. This is where he said, please, please, can we talk? And I said, look, I said, move on. I found somebody else I love. That's you. Oh, 
So now you become a bonding agent with that new relationship. If you stop, human nature means there's a part of them that's going to be wondering why you stopped. Even if they're with that new person, human nature means we can't help but wonder about the person strong enough to walk away. Did they realize we're not as great as we thought we were? And what if this new person that I'm with now, what if they turn out not to be great? Which, by the way, they will turn out to be flawed. And when your ex finds out that the new person is flawed too, and you're not in pursuit anymore, now you have kind of a double whammy working on your behalf. So just take a deep breath. Don't feel like you have no choice but to keep pursuing and keep trying to talk them out of it because, hey, I've already done it this far. What you're doing there is you're kind of being addicted to the connection. So the people that I'm talking about, they keep reaching out because they can't let it go. The truth is there's a part of them that thinks, look, if I send them 17 messages today, even if I'm getting ignored, I'm still, I'm still sending a message. I'm still kind of having a conversation. Granted, it's a one-way conversation, but they're still in my life. I'm still connected to them. So what's happened is you've kind of mistaken your desperation as a connection. Desperation isn't a connection. It's an attraction drainer. The more you recognize that, the more you can disconnect. But instinctively at first, you're going to think that your repeated pursuit is in some ways evidence that that the two of you are still together. You imagine the future where you're not reaching out to them at all. And that seems even scarier. That seems even scarier than being ignored. Even if reaching out and getting ignored is draining attraction, and kind of keeping you locked into that pit of despair, at least it's a connection that you still have. Let go of it. It's just like mental and emotional poison. It's keeping you addicted to the idea that they're not gone. They're gone. But you consistently reinforcing that you haven't left and you have no plans to leave, you're making it impossible for them to miss you. You can't miss somebody that is stapled and welded to your side and refuses to let you go. Somebody that has a death grip around your leg, It's really hard to miss somebody that's got a death grip around your leg. So just take a deep breath. If any one of these stages fits you, you haven't sabotaged it forever. So don't feel like you have. I also know every situation is different. So if I can help, I do one-on-one coaching for breakups. Let me know if I can. I'll talk to you again soon. Thanks.